felt like the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. Um, and welcome to the 2024 Pigot Lecture. Um, this is an annual lecture event that is funded by the generosity of Mark Piggott and the Piggott Family Foundation. And we want to extend our thank you to them for uh, continuing to support entrepreneurship in the region. Um, and tonight's uh, lecture is a little bit different. Traditionally, we've had a single individual come up and tell you their story. Uh, what we wanted to do tonight was turn a focus on the stories of multiple entrepreneurs and founders. And we also wanted to turn a face on a part of entrepreneurship that is often not spoken about despite its enormous economic impact. And that is principally female founders, female entrepreneurs. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time in a conversation with our five entrepreneurs. I'm gonna introduce each one of them. And then we're gonna go through a series of questions. The way tonight's gonna to work is, um, we've got a series of questions that we've worked out among the panel. I've solicited uh, excellent questions from the students created some of my own. We'll go through as many of those as possible. If we have time at the end of the first session, the, the, the panel session, we'll turn it over to questions that you might have in the audience, things we might have missed. If we don't have time for that, the whole reason that we structured this with the panel conversation first and the meet and greet afterwards was so that you could ask follow-up questions to our presenters. They will all be here. Um, for the, uh, the the meet and greet session, it'll start about 6.30. Okay. So without any, oh, I guess I didn't say, I'm Chris Stevens, I'm an Associate Professor of Entrepreneurship and I'm hosting this year's lecture. So, uh, and finally, a thank you to uh, AJ Hoffren for all of the work that she helped um, with uh, setting this up and making sure that it runs smoothly. So we appreciate that. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce, um, our panelists um, with some bios that we worked out. So Jenny Stitchell is a wife and mother of two. Um, baby Josie arrived 14 weeks ago. Jenny was born and raised in Spokane and graduated from Gonzaga in 2013 after turning down a job as an executive assistant to Tony Robbins. Jenny started her own triathlon and nutrition firm, JBC Wellness, where she coached 50 to 60 Ironman and endurance athletes for two years. In 2015, she founded Pantry Fuel, which is Spokane's first healthy local meal prep delivery business. She sold Pantry Fuel in December of this year. For the last two years, Jenny has taught our introductory course in entrepreneurship, where she's channeled her experiences as a founder and an owner, inspiring GU students to build their business ideas. Jenny is finalizing a new venture right now, a consulting company to help small firms and artisans utilize AI to expand and grow their businesses while finding work-life balance. Welcome, Jay. Julie Pinnell was raised in Moscow and studied early childhood development at the University of Idaho. Julie has always been committed to a fit lifestyle and completed her first marathon in 2010. Later that year, she was surprised by an unexpected heart attack at the age of 37. As a survivor, Julie has returned to an active lifestyle and is committed to using her story to inspire others to overcome physical adversity in their lives. With that desire to encourage others towards health and fitness, Julie and her husband Wade opened their first Fleet Feet store in Spokane in 2012. They currently have six locations across the state. Fleet Feet is dedicated to supporting Spokane's running and fitness enthusiast communities by providing quality training programs, educational opportunities, and the right footwear for customers. Welcome, Julie. Tanya Starkle is the mom of two boys, 12 and 9 years old, married to a stay-at-home dad who makes soccer practice and all other things possible. <laughs> She's in her seventh year as a full-time realtor. She loves real estate and loves investing in real estate personally as well as helping other people build wealth through real estate. She is a luxury specialist and works with clients in all price ranges. She has always been an entrepreneur and had her own business. She and her family moved back to Spokane in 2016 to be near family and near the best lakes around where you will find them spending most of their years. Dr. Roche Bell is from the tiny town of Davenport, Washington, just 45 minutes west of here. She owns and operates two chiropractic clinics in Spokane and specializes in the head and neck region. She primarily works with migraine patients in complex cases and is one of 60 doctors in the world who has, owned a uh, has earned a postgraduate diploma 
of craniocervical junction procedures. You seriously wrote that yeah. so that I had to read it, right? <laughs> um, Dr. Bell was second in the state of Washington in snow, in snow ski racing at the age of four. And her first job was driving wheat combines and giant tractors. A two-time All-American at the University of Redlands, Dr. Bell was inducted into the Redlands Hall of Fame in 2016. She has two biological children, ages two and six, and a bonus daughter, who's 13. Welcome. Maisa Abadaya has called Spokane home since 2018, when she and her family immigrated to Spokane seeking asylum from Jordan. Despite holding a bachelor's degree in information systems and an international stockbroker's license, upon initially arriving in Spokane, Misa found job opportunities hard to come by. After beginning a home-based catering firm in Spokane, Misa partnered with fellow local entrepreneurs, Dan Todd and Ross Harper, to begin Feast Collective and Feast World Kitchen. Feast's innovative model provides a shared cooking and restaurant space for dozens of local immigrant families, providing them with an opportunity to leverage their heritage and their love for local food and to train for a career, establish a catering business, and connect with their new community. For her work with Feast and her many other efforts at connecting immigrant and refugee families with the Spokane community, Misa also serves as a bilingual specialist for Spokane Public Schools, assisting Arabic-speaking students and their families. She was recognized with the YWCA Spokane's 2023 Women of Achievement Award for Arts and Culture. This past December, Misa became the new owner of Pantry Food. Welcome. So, panelists, lots of questions. We'll start with you, and then we'll ask everybody to answer this question if that's okay. Why did you want to start a business and be your own boss? And why did you choose what you chose? Yes, please. Then you'll have to hold it reasonably. Yeah. Hey, everyone, can you hear me? <laughs> um, yeah, honestly, like I never assume or think about I'm going to own a business. But my journey, I'm an immigrant. I came over here for my American dream. Uh, but like it was so hard moving between a job and a job. Uh, that's uh, like I was 36 years old <laughs> while I had three, four degrees. And I didn't know what I'm going to do. So I told myself, OK, I'm going to own my business. I'm not going to let anyone judge me, you know? <laughs> so. Uh, a big part of my uh, journey uh, as an immigrant, I, I assume my I struggle comparing to all those families that I met and I helped. Uh, I never been in a war, I never been in a camp, mm. and I still struggle. So a part of my mission, uh, I want to help. So I found myself that hey, I can I can own a business and at the same time I can get <laughs> yeah I can take and I can get some. Julie, would you like to answer that question? Why'd you start a business? Uh, well, a little bit was in my bio, obviously, um, and just that kind of life-changing event definitely makes you think, well, if we're going to do it now, we may as well take seize the moment. So um, uh, running really was part that inspired both my husband and I, and so uh, just taking that leap into um, sharing that gift with others. Um, and the the store obviously is you know self footwear, but we do a lot more than that with our training groups and just the running community, the, the ways that we um, just change people's lives every day with um, the power. Of uh, so I really like to manage my own time and schedule. <laughs> if we're being honest, right? <laughs> so I really like to manage my own time and schedule. I like to manage my own efforts and what that energy goes into. So for me, um, entrepreneurship comes from a whole inspiration of family who were also entrepreneurs. My great-grandfather opened the first tire store in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, they ran it for 60 years. Uh, and my tutu, which means grandparent in Hawaii, she ran her own beauty shop for 30 years in Hawaii. And my uh, grandpa here in town, what is most of um, Logan's neighborhood down here, um, now is uh, mostly a lot of the homes are owned by Gonzaga for Gonzaga Housing, but my grandpa was the builder originally for a lot of those homes down here. 
I was really inspired by them. And then um, most recently, my aunt and uncle were the founders of um, Mary Hill Winery and Tasting Rooms. Um, and it's 25 years this year. So, um, you know, I'm really inspired by my family. And I see the benefits of, of starting up something of your own and owning your own business, managing your own time and schedule. Um, but also Pantry Fuel came about because I saw a need. Um, in our community specifically. And uh, it it came from my tutu who was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Um, and about five months later, she passed away. So it was a really quick diagnosis. And during that time, my father and I were the caregivers and taxing her to different doctor's appointments and realized there's really no healthy, convenient food in Spokane. There's nothing easy that, that's healthy. And I know the healthiest food is local food. Um, we can source it locally and keep that nu yeah, nutrient density in the food. And so um, after college, I went to work for Julie, actually, at Fleet Feet. <laughs> That's how our stories connect. And so in the back of her store, um, I started writing the website, sorry, for Pantry Fuel. <laughs> and so um, it was this idea that, you know, we really had a problem in Spokane. We needed to find a solution, which was to finding healthy, convenient meals. That's really what the vision I had for Pantry Fuel this whole time. And so um, I had a coaching business uh, with Ironman athletes and various endurance athletes. And I probably pulled a lot of people from um, Fleet Feet at the time to be my customer and first pilot customer to Pantry Fuel, um, surveyed them and, and figured out what to do for the next steps. I left Fleet Feet and started Pantry Fuel. And um, really, it's just been a passion of mine to help you know, Spokane be, you know, support the well-being and health of Spokane through healthy, more convenient meals. And now we have that. So I also didn't really want to necessarily start a business. I was headed to med school. Um, first and foremost, I wanted to help people get better faster and stay better longer after I had an injury in sports in high school. And that is a pretty clear path to, you know, med school, you go into a residency, you work in a hospital setting. Um, and I got rerouted by a friend who told me I'd be a good chiropractor and I laughed at her and um, said, you're crazy. Um, long story short, here I am. And in the chiropractic world, there's not really that, you know, stepping stone of um, having a, a career. So you kind of have to start your own practice um, in, in chiropractic, I remember, you know, a couple quarters in, they said, oh yeah, chiropractors kind of like eat their young. And I'm like, this is, that sucks. <laughs> um, luckily I found a mentor who kind of took me under his wing. So it was an associateship. And then he um, had a path for me to help me open a practice. So basically became an investor in the practice um, for me to buy out, um, which is where I feel my passion now because we want to recreate that and help other women and, and young students um, coming out of school to not eat my young and to help lift them up um, and be successful chiropractors too. So yes, I did. Uh, I was never looking to start my own business. I actually started in college with Cutco and had a Cutco business for 16 years. So um, I helped people retain their clients and generate more business, um, running that across the country. Um, which is actually where I met Jenny. Um, but I had a passion for real estate always, and I just finally decided to get my license in 2016 because I love real estate and I love investing in it and helping people. Marketing is a pet peeve of mine, bad marketing. Um, and so I decided to, you know, it was really struggle uh, struggle because I had a great business already, so to start all over was a lot. Um, but I went for it, and... I love the marketing and helping people. So, so I'm going to stick with you um, because the next question that I have is, what is the single thing, the single most important thing that you think you've done to make your business a success? You talked about that struggle. What have you done that you think has made a difference? For me, I'd say consistency, and in that, the way that you treat your people and and help them, okay. and just being consistent. Uh, mine, for sure, is the passion and conviction behind what we do. Um, I have my own personal story, and then seeing stories and the health of our 
world right now is is tanking. Um, we are last in health rankings of any industrialized nation. Um, we're sicker. Our kids are sicker. So all of that fuels my fire to make a difference in our community. So that helps me be successful for sure. Um, after that, coaching. I've always, always had a coach, whether it's a business coach or a life coach. Um, aside from payroll, it's the biggest expense that I have in my business. Always have a coach. Tiger Woods had a coach. Mm -hmm. And a follow-up on that before we go on to Jenny, who might also want to. Um, the, how, did, how did you find the people who mentored? Retrospectively, because I've been told this, is uh, somehow I have a really great self-awareness of, of what I need in that moment, and it's evolved. Initially, right coming out of school, I knew nothing about, I, I could use my hands and I could adjust because that's what they teach you in school, but I knew nothing about patient management and how many visits should they be seen, and um, so I had a coach who taught me that. And then I became a clinic director, which means I was in charge of hiring and firing people, but I didn't know how to do that. So I hired somebody who was more of a business coach, a leadership leadership coach. And then I purchased the practice and I had to understand all my numbers and the P&Ls and the balance sheet. And I had to have employee manuals, all of that stuff, none of which I like to do. So I hired a business coach to make sure I had all of those systems in place. Um, and I was... And then, and then I realized seven years into business, because I love what I do and it's a passion, um, that I had had Australia on my list of places to travel and I had never gone because I didn't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I hired a life coach and they helped me travel. Jen, say the most important oh, thing you feel like you've done in your pure business is a success. I know this question I had to think about quite a bit because if you just wanted one, yeah, you know, I could go on and on. Um, also, I feel like I just need to sit up real straight here, too, because I'm sitting next to a Cairo. I'm like, okay, I'm going to adjust my back here. <laughs> right? She might, actually. She might. Um, staying committed to my vision. You know, my vision for, my vision for Pantry Fuel um, was to create a healthier Spokane through convenient, healthy meals. You know, it was similar to yours, that passion and that commitment to vision. Um, but also for me, I mean, I was 24 when I started my business. I was two years outside of this, literally this classroom, Gonzaga. Um, the idea for Gonzaga started in my first entrepreneurship class here um, over just over 10 years ago. Um, it was this idea that, that formed and then when my tutu um, passed away, it flourished. But you know, I was 24 and I really needed to ask good questions to mentors, to my employees that I was hiring, to, you know, the circle that I trusted around me. And so I always sought feedback. And I think that for me is probably the number one, that commitment to vision, but seeking feedback um, and being adaptable to, um, to change and understanding that I can reach that vision um, with so many other, in so many other directions than I initially thought while bringing in that wise feedback um, from mentors, employees, and just realizing that having a diverse perspective on my own vision actually boosts my, my business. And it's better, you know, allowed me to be more of a, have a more of a flexible leadership style, um, which, which helps because in the startup world, you're constantly changing and making decisions. And so um, I think just seeking out um, feedback from, from those you trust was really important from the beginning for me. Julie, what do you think? The single most successful thing. It's hard to pinpoint, but um, I think just building exceptional teams to be alongside you, um, that we can't do it all. Um, and so having you know, a partner that uh, complements your strengths um, and you know, uh, having someone that can do the things that you don't like, like payroll or whatever it may be. That happens to be me, but uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, building those those exceptional teams for us. Obviously, we're retail store, so that starts at the ground level with our you know outfitters, our people that are helping customers as well, and um, just we really strive for consistency there, so that every customer has that same experience. And so, having exceptional teams that will raise that bar and want it. Bring that passion that we put to 
Nice. What do you think? What's one thing that you've done that's made your business success? Honestly, like it changes uh, or helping people uh, make their families in their life. <laughs> uh, I think that's the main thing. It's helping people flourishing their life, especially immigrants. We're talking about this specific uh, related to immigrants. And in the same time, as an immigrant, they like most people. They assume that uh, international cuisine couldn't be not here. Yeah. So I, I like it was a passion to buy pantry fuel and combine international healthy meals. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I'm gonna say that it's make it successful, changing those uh, stories and make a really good connection between uh, the American uh, culture and other culture. Uh, I think I just highlighted very important things in Spokane. It's uh, and points for the need and the services for this specific uh, uh, needs yeah. over here in this area. And I think that was really successful. Uh, and if you're looking now for people who's searching about Spokane, the first thing they're gonna it's gonna go about maybe teeth and the second brand with you. <laughs> I do both. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I'm going to stay with you. And, and I, what I want to ask each of you is, you know, there are a lot of reasons that ventures fail. Right? And, and one of the key ones is that they fail to listen to the customer or fail to pay attention to what the customer needs. Mm -hmm. Your Every business is customer facing, but all five of your organizations are extraordinarily customer facing. What is... How have you kept your focus on the customer? What what have you done that specifically thinks about this is the person who's buying my product or service, and this is how I'm going to structure my business to be most effective in that relationship? What do you think? Mostly, what I did sharing the stories uh, for every meal I'm uh, sending to with the customer, they have a story or cultural part mm -hmm. telling about someone like either over here or back home. Uh, uh, this is the most uh, thing that I feel that customer love about it. Uh, it's uh, it's a place like I create a place over here in Spokane that they can come, but they feel they prevalent all over the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Um, I think that we often. Uh, for us, at least, the you know a running start. Some people don't feel comfortable coming in, and we definitely want them to be that inclusive, more space. Um, so our mission um, is to inspire the athlete and everyone. So I mean, athlete, everyone can be an athlete. It doesn't have to be running. A lot of our customers would immediately come and say, "I'm not a runner, but I need shoes for X, Y, Z." And so just making sure that that. Um, Kind of have broadened their customer base than like a typical running store. So Levi actually said that to you. <laughs> my first one. But you know, then I'm training for a half marathon. Yeah. Right. Thing. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of people shy away from calling them themselves that, but at the right. same time, right. we're all athletes right. at some mm -hmm. point. Um, and for us, like that inspire word needs to breathe life into. You. So for whatever that journey that someone is on, to help them. Well, I vividly remember customers saying that I'm not a runner. And I would say, Have you ran before? You were really, you know, yeah. to make you feel more comfortable. And it's true. Um, let's see. Um, question one more time. So, what, what have you done to keep your focus on the customer? Mm -hmm. Whether that's with JBC Wellness mm -hmm. or whether that's with Pantry Fuel, what do you think? Like, to be very specific, from the beginning, starting up Pantry Fuel, the first thing I did before the company ever started and I had a paying customer um, was to collect Google surveys. I made surveys and I sent it out to everyone in my circle. And it's, I know this is very specific, but that was the first thing I did in starting up my company. And that was so beneficial because I got an idea of product um, that they were interested in, pricing, um, days of the week that meals should be delivered, what that looked like. Um, and then I could take all that into account as I was developing and starting up the business. Um, throughout, as I would introduce more products, I continued to 
send out surveys via email to um, mostly just our top customers because I knew um, you know, they were who we retained for a long time. Um, so always surveying on new products that we wanted to bring um, forward. And then uh, I probably one of the most fun things I did um, uh, you know, to keep communication or to keep, keep the focus on the customers was to send out an email. Um, so every like couple weeks, I would send out a personalized email for myself and it would highlight the news in the community. And so um, email targeting was really important to continue that conversation with our customers. And again, these are very specific examples. Um, but that allowed a conversation to open up with our customers so that they could reach out and say, oh yeah, I've, I've heard about this event. Do you know more about it? Or, hey, can you list our event that's going on next week? Uh, and so that, you know, being an online only store, you know, that was our storefront, it was only online. The type of, you know, connection and, and face to face, I, I didn't get that with a customer that you would have with a, with a typical storefront. And so being able to um, connect with them over email and, and trying to engage in that way was really important, but sending out surveys whenever products were new, um, collecting reviews, you know, automating all of that from the beginning became really, really important so that I didn't have to um, ask customers all the time, what do you think about us? What do you think about us? You know, automating those reviews through the use of what's now, you know, AI technology, it's so easy to do, but it's really important when starting up a business because, um, you know, that allows that open communication without kind of forcing it. So, yeah. Thank you. So specifically in the beginning, we had a box with a piece of paper and said, tell us what you think. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as Jenny said, now it's so super easy. Um, our most recent thing that we've done is implemented a software called Review Wave. So it's just an appointment reminder. And after you have a visit or after you come into a store, you can use it and apply it to any business or any service. You send them an email and, or a text. Um, text is actually the, you know, right now, the, you get the most fastest feedback. So um, it just says, hey, rate us. And they rate us. And if, if we like their rating, we offer them the option to tell their story on Google. And Google is, you know, the big, big bad wolf. I don't know. It's, it's the SEO driver. So if you can get Google reviews, it's going to, you know, chop you up and up and up. Um, the other thing is train our staff. Um, one of my favorite books is called Unreasonable Hospitality. And so we are constantly striving and surveying our staff. I review, I love fresh minds. So anytime we have a new employee, I interview them at 90 days and ask them um, where they see the biggest gaps. So it's from their perspective, new to the team. And then, you know, interviewing your customers, of course. Um, and quality care, you have to get results and it has to be a good product. Um, I mean, for us, it's like we don't win unless our clients win, and so and every client is different. So always asking all the questions and diving in to each client. Um, we really do um, appreciation events throughout the year and client guests to keep in contact and emails and texts and all that. But um, every client is different, so just really learning about that individual. And I want to stick with you for this question because. Your model's a little bit different than the rest of the folks up here, right? In that most of us, um, you know, my wife and I have been here for 15 years. We purchased two houses, sold one house, right? It, you, yours is, is a much more episodic relationship. How do you keep engaged with folks who may not, you know, who, who don't see themselves as your principal customer for maybe another 10 years? Right, and so we are we don't just help people buy or sell, but we help with the whole living experience in between. So anything home. So okay. any questions they have, we're their resource. Good, thank you. Um, it's a challenging time to try to find employees. Over the last few years, as we've gone through the ebbs and flows associated with COVID, we've gone from places where it's, you know, everybody's looking for a job and nobody's looking for a job. And, um, and, and we also have very different sort of priorities. Folks who are looking for jobs have very different priorities about what work looks like and how they want to engage with work. As each of you think about how you've managed the employees in your organization, what what's the most important thing that you think? What's what's most important to you when it comes to finding the right people? And then, how do you make sure that you're sort of finding those people and holding on to them? What do you do? Um, we can start with anybody who wants to start. 
Um, I mean, I, I'm not hiring lots of people, but I, it's meeting with them in person and just looking at the whites of their eyes and, yeah. and, and the way they dress, the way they walk, the way they present themselves, um, and just chatting with them. So that'd be my main thing. And can you speak a little bit more about why that's your primary criteria? I understand it, but I want to make sure that. Because you can just. The way somebody carries themselves, you just you can just tell a lot about them, mm -hmm. um, versus over a telephone or something else. Thank you. Piggyback on that, our um, interview process starts or our application process starts with a video. They have to send a video, so I have three prompted questions, and um, they have to send a video answering those specific questions for that reason. So if you get, you know, hundreds of applications, how, you know, one, mo a lot of people aren't going to go through the time to actually do that because um, they're just pushing out applications. And then um, two, once you see that and their energy and their, you know, their spirit um, come through and answering those questions, it can make a big difference. Um, I would say we ask internally. So we ask our first and foremost, our off most awesome employees, who do you know and love? Because if they're awesome, they hang out with awesome people and we want them to. Then we ask our patients. We put it up. We send it out in emails. Our patients already have a conviction, conviction of what we do and how we do it and why we're different. We're very different than any other chiropractor you've ever heard of or been to. So it's a unique, you know, a, a unique niche. And so our and our patients already understand it. So if if they um, end up being an employee, they're already off the get-go, super convicted and have a passion for what we do. So they represent us well and fit in with our culture. Um, and then, you know, most recently we we posted on Indeed. Yeah. That's our, you know, if we're if we're not getting any leads through that, um, then we ask for video interviews on Indeed. Yeah, similar to that, when I was hiring for pantry fuel, um, I would ask our, our customers actually first, you know, and say, hey, we're hiring. Do you know anyone great? Because usually your your customers already know what you stand for. They know your passion. They know your, your vision and your mission. And they hope probably that you get some good people in there ready to serve them the same way that you always have. Um, but I implement what's called a, I call it the beer test. <laughs> a mentor of mine taught me this a long time ago. And uh, simply put, could I sit down and have a drink, you're not 21, a coffee uh, with you? And could we just chat, you know? Uh, you gotta buy into the vision and the culture from the get-go. Um, but I, I really like to kind of shy away from technical questions. Um, and I like to get personal with people. I think um, if you can understand the whole employee and you bring in some questions that are really personal, you um, get to know that person the person's family, what their values are. And I think that says a lot about um, culture these days, too. I mean, you're going to hear that word thrown around over and over again as you're applying for a job. Is, um, do you fit into the culture? And um, a really good way to get to know if someone's going to fit in with your vision or culture to be a little more personal than, than those technical questions. And I think I, I see that all the time now. And a lot of big companies are um, not bringing in more of those technical questions until the second or third interview. Sure. To make sure that you can, you know, fit into that culture and vision. Julie, thoughts on this? I agree that, you know, fitting in so that your culture really makes sense. Um, you want to make sure that it's not going to disrupt your team that you currently have. Um, and then it, it's important for us um, just to make sure that uh, they're an empathetic, like, humble person in the sense of. One of our values is check your ego at the door. Um, and so if they come in telling me about all their races and how fast they are at this and that, uh, it's not necessarily enticing, you know. Um, those kind of people want to work at our store per se, but um, not necessarily who's going to be a good listening ear to you know, someone across the way um, who has foot pain and needs <laughs> to just get to the mailbox. Um, so uh, it's important. Um, Really, that piece is more important than their knowledge. Right. Um, you can definitely train them and teach them the tools, but if they don't have that empathetic um, side, then that's what they do. And I, I want to follow up with you because I, I think one of the things that's been interesting about the journey that, that uh, the way you yourself have been on is that you started small, grew to a lot of work, a lot of stores. You then recently, you know, moved back a little bit in terms of scale. 
as you think about managing employees in a business that was small, larger, smaller, are there challenges that come up with that transition that you found? Um, yes, obviously, when it's just, you know, you and three other people, if someone's sick and you're there. Uh, so, you know, when we have stores across the state, I can't make Tacoma at 10 a.m. to open the store. Um, so, you know, we have to have good teams for that. Um, uh, when it got bigger, it, it's definitely harder to know everyone. And for me, um, kind of the HR person, I still would have a phone call. Um, with everyone that we hire. Um, and usually it's my manager who wants to hire the person and I just want that final like check. And often it's just a question of, so tell me a little bit about yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's open-ended and depending on what that is, you know, it tells a lot about who they are. Um, sure. And um, lots of times, you know, again, my manager wanted to hire them. So it's probably, but there's been a few times that they've just given me pause and be like, let's have a conversation, you know, yeah. Behind the scenes, so um, it's it's definitely you know it challenge people are challenging, but they're also the best thing, best asset we have. Right. Yeah. you've got a slightly different situation than everybody here yeah. because most of your employees are sort of single engagement type of employees. They're coming in, they're doing a, they're they're cooking a meal, they're creating an opportunity. And then you're engaging with another group of folks who are employees. So how, how did you manage that very different kind of culture around bringing in the right people and keeping them there? Honestly, like if you come to both the places, you will love it because it's, it's every time there is a story behind it, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, for, uh, let's say for my, some of my employees, the American who born and raised over here, it's interesting for them every day they're watching a movie, a different story. Um, it's a kind of learning experience for both sides. Uh, with hiring people from here, I always uh, like uh, confirm that ha we have to be patient. Uh, we have to be respectful with the culture. Uh, I understand like we're all human. We always judge about other things and other colors. But the most important to me for both, either immigrant or uh, American as an employee, to understand each other, to be patient about each other, uh, to ask, you know, like, hey, usually you will walk with your phone for selfie, but like there is some culture that they just want to be, like there is some women, they just want to be any social, or they just want to, so they just ask, be respectful for like all of it, all what we talk about, it's a culture thing. So how you be successful to bring culture between those who do, uh, it's, it's not easy. You still have a lot of situation, but I think uh, as, as, as long as you go, as, as successful as it's gonna be, you know, like it's, uh, it's like you're having experience with any other story and this uh, kind of uh, learning experience for you. Okay, like I didn't know that, but next time I will improve my, uh, things with them so uh, it's not easy but like I think they they do great together uh, for me personally uh, I, I, sh I have some challenges because of, like how a white person uh, got needed by immigrants <laughs> it's a little bit hard uh, but I want to like I want to tell everyone that hey like immigrant also a human you know like I can be a leader I can be even if I still have an accent, <laughs> I'm speaking three languages. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, I want to be open uh, about everything. Uh, hear it from them, and they can hear it from me. Sure. Uh, I want to change the idea. Like, honestly, like, that's my passion to change the idea that, hey, uh, when, when I came over here in general, immigrants, it's the low class, mm -hmm. the nothing, it's the people who are poor. I wasn't bored when I came over here. I came just to do something for me and my family. Uh, so I want to change this. That hey, like uh, immigrants in general are hard workers. When I'm hiring immigrants, like I'm telling you, that they work non-stop. Like either for venture fuel or fees. Fees, honestly, uh, the idea of fees is uh, hiring uh, independent contractors. So I'm not. It's a non-profit organization. 
So I'm not making money from those people. They I'm leveraging their life. So every family they cook in the restaurant, they go back home with two thousand, two twenty five, sometimes five, six thousand dollars. So this is gonna make something in their life. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I I open opportunity for them because they couldn't find a job outside. Uh, saving those money, like I have four of them now, they have their own business. Like it's okay if you don't speak the language, you're gonna catch it sooner or later. You're gonna catch it. But it doesn't mean that you can't do anything if you don't speak the language. Yeah. Well, and I think you just answered a big chunk of the next question that I had for all five of you, which is, what does success look like for you? Mm -hmm. And if we think about feast, I, I think I think what I what I've heard from you over and over again in our individual conversations in here is this this nature of flourishing, right? The, yeah. Of of creating an opportunity for individuals to take advantage of their own abilities yeah. um, to, to do something meaningful in the community, meaningful for them and meaningful in, in that the community can see it. Do you want to expand on that or um, is that what success looks like you think in the context of peace in particular? So honestly, I don't know if I have the capacity to expand. Okay. Uh, like definitely the need is mm -hmm. Like the community want us to grow, but right. like it's it's a lot. Right. It's so hard. Like it's a small organization now. It has hundred and twenty chefs. Right. Uh, Which seems big. <laughs> yeah, but like when you're talking about a non-profit organization, right. it's so hard. Like to keep hiring people, you want to keep Absolutely. this in a process. Uh, but uh, my my goal is just to have a chance. Like every. Let's say every eight months, I have a group of those people, and I'm pretty sure from 100, there is four or five people going to be really successful outside. Uh, this has changed a lot in our community, you know? Like, I can tell, like, as a person came over here to spoken, the service that, the, like, my people used to get, barely I got something. Like, I couldn't find any place to help me with some... Question, you know, <laughs> generally question, how this bus is going? <laughs> I don't know the system of the bus. I don't know some stuff. So I couldn't find a service comparing the change that we did in the last six years. Now you have four or five organizations working with the for uh, this uh, people. Uh, I think I think it just impacts a lot to the community, which is an yeah. Julie, do you want to talk about what success looks like? I think it's. Um, each individual customer for us, um, you know, and that looks different for everyone that walks in the door, but um, whether it's that they're coming in to get a new pair of shoes for uh, a race that they're doing, you know, and we can be part of that story. Um, or, you know, I think of a few weeks ago, I was working at our rally store and and there was a man that came in and he had a cane and you know he was in a lot of pain and through you know just listening to his story helping him find some good footwear some other tools that we have in the store um you know he literally his gait like has changed just walking and hopping around the store and uh you know checked him out he was thrilled and he left and i looked down and the cane was sitting at the register and he came back like five minutes later. Oops, I forgot this. But you know, he had come in, just hunched over, hobbled, and left, just like upright and excited. And so, you know, it's we changed his life that day, you know, with a pair of shoes. Yeah. And so um, that's inspiring, um, you know, to do as well as um, the training groups that we do and other things. Um, and then if that customer goes and shares that with another friend, who then refers another customer back to right. us. Thank you. Well, I always uh, I always had the goal to sell Cancer Fuel, and I couldn't think of a better person <laughs> to pass it over to. Like, I'm so excited that you took it over, because um, you're just, I mean, you're doing such wonderful things for the community. Yeah. I'm so excited Thank for you. you. Um, and just kind of to piggyback off that, um, really, success is to provide other opportunities for, for people. I mean, in business, you you're a leader. And you have to take that role seriously if you're going to step into owning a business, especially one that's very forward, customer facing. Um, and so to be able to give other people opportunities to step in um, to a business, whether it's selling a business to someone who, you know, who's going to go ahead and grow it bigger and better than I ever could. Um, or 
an employee of mine, you know, I had a chef for about five years and he was pretty unhirable by anyone else. And, uh, you know, not necessarily a fault of his own, but he, he had some, um, some substance abuse issues. And so he was, he actually, you know, was starting to clean up his life. And, um, he, when I hired him, he had a lot of, um, a lot of leadership skills that he needed to gain. And I was able to help teach him that. And this might be a question that comes up later, but um, in teamwork with a coach that I hired for our team. And so um, for me, giving someone an opportunity to grow and now, you know, five years later, he's found a job that he loves. He's hireable anywhere, any kitchen in Spokane. He's running his own kitchen, his own team. He now has the skills to do that. To me, like that's the ultimate, it's the ultimate skill to give people opportunities. So you can feel the passion clearly of like, you know, I think all of us just love making a big impact and helping other people and lifting people up. And um, at the end of the day, it's really hard to lift people up if you can't keep your doors open. So I love numbers and I track numbers all the time. So for us, if I'm going to get really linear, um, the 10% growth year over year is a success for us. Um, we want ultimately five locations with three providers in each location in the Pacific Northwest. We have North and South. We're working on East and West, and then we have a mystery location in there. Um, the other stat is a 25% profit margin, which is exceptional in our industry. So those are specific numbers that we're constantly tracking. Um, cause again, if, you know, I have the biggest heart and want to help people, um, it doesn't go very far if, if I don't have a business that people can come to to get well. So clearly making an impact on people's health and wellness, um, but also, yeah, you, our staff, you know, we love them. Uh, you, my favorite, you know, I, I think I feel the most warm and fuzzy is when a member of my staff leaves because I, I hate that. <laughs> it crushes me when somebody I love moves on. We recently had a, an employee move to Florida and I, she was so awesome. But she sent me a message and said, hey, what's your life word? And I, she goes, mine is such and such. And, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, she's still doing a line word exercise that we provide. You know, that's part of you asked about how we keep people, too. You know, it's, it's investing in your team, um, how we keep employees. So I think obviously the passion, but knowing your numbers is really important. Yeah, you really think. I mean, real, real estate is a very competitive number of business, mm -hmm. but I would say the success has really been reviewed in the complete business and then helping um, other people on our team be successful. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk about community for a second if we can, and, um, and I think we'll stay with you. What, what does it look like to build community? You've talked a little bit about how that's so essential to what you think of as your brand. Mm -hmm. um, what does that look like? Hold on, I mean, we'll wait just a second for the folks to move it, so I'll make sure that folks can Yeah, it's, it's fine. Yeah. Thank you, all of you who had to say, or had to go back. Thank you for doing the call. Yeah, yeah, that's also, thank you for doing the call. All right, so community, what do you think? Um, I mean, we try to give back when we can, help out with Habitat for Humanity, and we've done every, um, Donations and, and things like that. Um, always looking to do more. You know, yeah. it's a challenge sometimes with busy schedules and all of that. But um, always working to help the community we live in, which is all of us. And what about inside the business? How do you feel like you create a culture of community, um, with, either with customers or with employees? I, I was going to say earlier, I think like listening, it's the little details that matter. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of um, men in general in my business um, don't always pay attention to the little things that they think are maybe frivolous. Mm -hmm. But if you dive into um, women, you'll find that those just different things matter and they're all different to different people. So it's just diving in and learning about them. Um, Community yeah, community outside, I would say in healthcare in general, people are very frustrated with providers 
because they go to many different providers, but they never they never talk to each other. And so it's very compartmentalized. Well, I have this specialist and I have this primary doctor, but then I can't, they don't know what they're doing. And so I'm getting prescribed this and, and told this, but is it really like working all together and they're frustrated. And so um, I would say building a community for us is a, a network of providers that are working together mm -hmm. to help people get better faster and stay better longer. This is a team effort. Health is multifaceted. So we've really honed in on our specialty and we, we know our, um, our niche and what we can provide for patients. And we're not trying to be everything to everyone because if, if I want the best meals, um, I'm not going to try to tell my patient the meals that they can make necessarily if I don't think that they're going to be successful actually making them. I'm going to say, I know somebody who has an amazing set of meals. You don't even have to worry about it. It's going to be more cost effective than you going to the grocery store and trying to make it yourself. It's also going to save you a ton of time. And I have the person that can deliver them right to your door. So it's, it's, um, I think community has to do with building the connections and the resources of other people who are doing exceptional work and creating meaningful relationships with those people so that when somebody comes in to work with you, you can point them in the direction like I have the best realtor who's who's going to go to work for you and find you the best opportunity that, you know, create a magical home. And so I think that's key. Again, somebody mentioned putting your ego at the door. It really in order to do that, it really requires you to put your ego at the door mm -hmm. and realize that other people may be able to help, you know, in other ways that you can. And that's okay. And I think you said it perfectly earlier. It was like, or, or maybe you delegate where you're weak, right? Like delegate where you don't, or where you don't want to work, <laughs> like the things you don't want to take on. Um, community for, for pantry fuel is a little different. Um, I, you know, in, in person, um, relationship is really important to me, but again, something that's taken away when you have an online business often, um, when you're, you know, you have people delivering your food, dropping it at the door and they never meet you. Um, so for me, uh, I think in-person marketing and, and com community building is really um, underutilized nowadays with social. And I think it's something that can really be beneficial for a business. So community looks like um, putting on nutrition classes for um various business, you know, partnering with various businesses and putting on nutrition classes or um, cooking classes for kids. I partnered with a few schools in town. I did some cooking classes for kids. For me, that was just community that was fun, but it, but it builds, you know, if you have a, a strong community, it builds strong loyalty and word of mouth as well. So that supports the business and bottom line. Um, the, the most fun thing that I did for community within Pantry Fuel happened right after 2020, and I was craving it myself. And I started a cookbook cooking club called Pantry Pals. It was a spinoff of Pantry Fuel. It was so much fun. We got a church to donate um, one of their kitchens for us to use. And every month we would focus on one cookbook. And you could pick a recipe from that cookbook. And everyone would come and share a recipe. And usually it's the first time you're cooking it. So it could be shit or it could be, excuse me, it could be terrible. It could be great. But, um, but you know, you're trying it for the first time. You have this community built around food. And so kind of the definition for community for me is a shared vision and passion for, um, you know, shared, shared work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, runners definitely love to hang out and be in community. Uh, the running community specifically in Spokane is just, it's amazing. Um, and so we definitely felt blessed to become a part of that um, and help grow it more. <laughs> we, uh, we have lots of training groups um, that we do um, as part of our business. Um, so we have like a couch 5K night, it's called, um, we just help people learn to run. Um, and then we do 10K, half marathon, full marathon. We used to do triathlon when Jenny was around and uh, when it was a little bit more popular. Uh, but uh, that was a little bit more time intensive. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there, um, especially with our proximity uh, trail where we're at, um, we're always on the trail. Um, for broader in the community, um, we've adopted part of one of the one of the legs along the Centennial Trail. Um, we're actually doing like a cleanup on our state. Um, so um, yeah, love to be just part of uh, the running community. And I mean, people, that's where people get to deal with other people when you're out there.
they're running sure. 20 miles. You have a lot of time to talk. And so, you know, you hear people's stories. Um, and so I said community. How do you build community? I mean, we've talked about this before. If you don't have any issues, it's yeah, fine. Yeah. So that, yeah. Uh, honestly, like, I can tell hundreds of stories, right. uh, but uh, like the one thing that honestly, like, I feel it helped all the community and impact in my life. I'm a mom. I'm very big supportive for women. <laughs> so I like always love support women. I came from Middle East in general women, uh, somehow culturally, not religion or anything, culturally they will really treat it bad. And I thought when I came over here that, hey, America, women rights, uh, nobody can say anything for me, I can do whatever I want. But then I did, that's the shock for me, that's no, like in America I met couple of situations that opened my mind that, hey, there is a lot of immigrant women in isolation and they left behind and uh, in a really bad situation. Those women are moms. And if moms healthy, the whole community is healthy. So I feel that I need to do something. And honestly, this is a big part why I got me Women of Ashima right. last year because I worked with around seven cases uh, to the point I put myself in the <laughs> Uh, but like I like I never been in a situation that I didn't know how to do or to help those women. So I walk with them step by step. Uh, I know like four of them now are successful and having their own stuff. After a couple of years, from years, someone can put in their head that you're a loser. You're not gonna make anything. The only thing you're gonna do is just the kitchen. And now her life, like a couple of them, their life changed. A lot, and I feel this is very uh, like it's a change. It has a huge impact in the community. If the mom is healthy, her kids is healthy, the whole community is. Healthy. I want to go to the worst piece of advice you've ever received. So we'll start over here somewhere. Go ahead. Shay, you look like you wanted to take yeah, that question. We're ready. <laughs> Um, in the chiropractic world, it's interesting um, because you you have a lot of pressure. There's I don't know egos and stuff, but there are a, there is a, a large demographic of chiropractors that say you should never give away free exam, mm -hmm. and that for me is probably the worst advice because I agree of not giving away free services, and I have a you know. I can have a problem with that because I like to help people. So I would give away free care and, you know, adjustments and all sorts of stuff for free. So I do have to keep that in check. However, when ch chiropractic has had an uphill battle and there is a committee on quackery back in the day that, that has tried to take out chiropractic and a lot of people have, we haven't done very good, you know, mass marketing on what chiropractic is and does and can do and how much of an impact it can make. And so versus like dentists, for example, you know that once you have teeth, you should go to the dentist. So at what age are most people going to the dentist? They're babies, right? Like their first teeth pop out. You know, we know that we should take our kids to the dentist. Well, we have the same philosophy in chiropractic, but that's never been expressed in a, in a way that people grasp it. And so the worst advice for me is to not give away free exams. And that's because... If, you, if there's constant barriers and people don't understand what you do, you have to give them something that they can't say no to. Mm -hmm. So if if time is a barrier, then figure out a way to, to take away the time barrier. If money is a, bit, a barrier for them and they don't want to spend $500 on initial exam because they don't know what they're going to get and they're skeptical, you know, that, that gives them an opportunity to at least put their foot in the door and explore something different. So the, the promotional piece of that, um, for me, is how I started my business. I was out in every single community event and I was offering free exams. They didn't know me. I'm right out of school, you know, um, just, just back in the community. So allowing them to just saying, hey, you can come to the office, no charge, check out where we are. Um, We'll do a full exam, and if you want to continue with care, great. If not, then maybe I'll see you at the next event, you know? <laughs> Worst advice. Worst advice. 
I mean, all I could think of was don't put all your eggs in one basket because mm -hmm. I feel like in business, you need all your eggs in the basket. There's so much great hustle and work that goes mm -hmm. into it. If you're not fully committed, you're right. more likely to fail. Right. So. Julie? Okay. I had a hard time with this question too. Um, and I don't know that I can like pinpoint the exact thing, but like the the thought, um, I guess, is just to like play it safe, don't mm -hmm. rush into things too much. Okay. Um, and we uh, started our business here um, and then just had opportunities that came about um, like in 2015 and we expanded and you know purchased a store and then bought two more stores and then like it just was kind of a ripple effect um, mm -hmm. and had we kind of said oh I don't know that we have all the right people we're not quite ready um, you know we wouldn't have seen the growth um, sure. that we did and so kind of that you know being willing to take risks right. is the opposite of it. Micah, do you have an answer to this question? The fourth piece of advice is just it's not gonna work. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah. You know, like you guys, uh, business, and you know, the risky business uh, in general, it's restaurants. Right. And um, I, I still remember even before, before uh, creating keys, like each time I'm looking for resources and asking food drugs or something, I can't remember someone told me go for it. Right. <laughs> it's not gonna work. It's right. not going to work. So uh, in general, my personality, I love uh, to try it, even if you're going to tell me, like, my personality, I respect every one experience, but it could be different for me. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it's not because I'm special, but, like, I, I feel that no matter what's going on around you, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be different from person to person. So... You're going to go to the doctor and he will give you advice. Maybe you, other person had the same thing. The, a little bit, the advice is going to be different. So, uh, yeah, so I told myself, I'm going to start, like, I'm going to start this no matter what. Uh, it was hard. It's not going to work. And then, uh, honestly, at like the beginning, uh, go back home. It's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So it's the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Came from an ex-boyfriend, so we know how that ended. <laughs> uh, well, I started at 24, so I'm too young, and I don't have enough experience. And, uh, you know, I could have let that stop me right then and there, over and over when you hear it. You're in your 20s starting a business, but here we are, eight years later. <laughs> Let's talk about work-life balance. Um, <clears throat> how do you maintain it? And if you... Think about how you structure your businesses and your work. Are there non-negotiables for you? Are there things you will not compromise on? And if you're willing to share those, what are they? Yeah. Start with me. Uh, so I had this rule with my employees. Um, I won't be near my phone uh, Monday through Sunday, any day of the week between 5 and 8 p.m., that's family time. So that was my non-negotiable. Unless the kitchen was on fire, don't contact me. And what I really liked about putting some boundaries into place with my employees is that allowed um, them to put boundaries in place and it builds trust. And um, you, start to, you start to gain trust with each other. Um, and I think having those boundaries, you know, has served me well in business, has served our employees well because um, yeah, I have some, I have some to say too. Um, yeah, I'll do oh, yeah, and there was like, um, so, so the white space, I really, that's what I call it. It's, I was thinking about that word, white space. I really create white space in my schedule, and so. For me to get pantry fuel to a point where I could actually manage my time and schedule um, to create white space was um, important for me. And if you haven't heard of that word, it's just you know time in your day and week to not have to um, answer to anybody, right? Um, to be able to 
to be able to choose how you want to spend that time and effort. So um, yeah, I think creating those boundaries was, was really important in creating that white space for me. Uh, well, I kind of despise the word balance because I actually think that it's unachievable mm -hmm. and I think it's more of a teeter-totter. And I've experienced it because when I was first out of school, there was really no family balance because it was work. I was getting the business up and running. I was working Monday through Sunday. I was seeing patients six days a week. I was at every networking event. I was at every run. I was the downtown riverfront park at movie night. I mean, <laughs> it was wild. So there was no balance. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, as you develop, and you create this momentum, like a snowball effect, you can create more of a teeter-totter, but it's this constant like break and dash pedal in life. And there are just gonna be some times where you can't create the balance because you know, you're know right now, like your kids are sick or um, somebody in your life passes away and, and you have to divert your energy at that time and it doesn't feel like it's very balanced most of the time I would say um, right now now that I have two kids I've focused much more energy on on family mm -hmm. and so I you know creating the systems and the team is really really important to create the balance per se because without my team, I would still be working six days a week and seeing as many patients as I could because we'd be overflowing. So when I hired my first associate, I was, you know, a new patient couldn't come in for three months. Um, I could see six new patients a week. Our team now can see 26 new patients a week, right? So if the growth and the team um, is what allows us to create white spaces um, so that we can you know, have the time and balance um, that we need to be sustainable because there is no way that if I was still doing what I did then and only pushing that work pedal that I wouldn't be crashing and burning by now. <laughs> so I would say, let's see, make sure I didn't miss anything, that it changes over time. Um, you know, you build a team slow and steady and as new grads, I would not expect to jump out and feel like you have work-life balance. I think that's an unrealistic expectation is if you really have the passion for something and you want to see it grow, it's going to take time. It does not come easy. I was going to say the same, same thing. Like when I read that question, I was like, I think that's kind of a farce that the, the media has given you that, you know, you can run a successful business and you can, uh, Go to all your kids' programs and go out to dinner with your husband and go to the spa and all, you know, in a day. And it's just like it doesn't happen. <laughs> um, and so it's perspective and what you're searching for, like you said, that give and take and it, what works for you. And so, you know, if it works for you to work that much right now, you're going to have to give some things up. But then you can get to another point in life where you have a little bit more um, time with family and because you built a good team. Um, so it, it, it's, it's perspective um, and making sure that you're, you're taking care of yourself along the way. Sure. Um, but um, the, yeah, I don't know that the true, like the way that we've been taught exists. And especially as entrepreneurs, right. you do have to, at the beginning, you're going to have to be the, you're the one that's like answerable at the end. So, um, you know, you can't expect to work. I would say everything that they said is 100% true. Um, but I would say, and um, also it just putting it in your schedule. So like mm -hmm. if you have put your vacations in your schedule before work takes over, you don't go on vacation, but you know, your gym time or whatever you're doing your family time, and actually commit to your schedule. So. Yeah, same thing like everyone, like changing, changing with the time, and a good heaven with the time, uh, and a team, just your team. I tell our students that you can have it all, but you can't have it all at once. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. 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 Um, we talked a little bit about team development, but I, I want to dig into this maybe just a little bit more. Um, you know, there's a lot 
there's a lot of research out there that talks about the differences between um, male-led and female-led firms, right? And and one of the one of the many areas where the research is very clear that there's a distinctive difference is that um, in women-led firms, there tends to be more investment in internal development. There tends to be more investment in team building. There tends to be a stronger emphasis on employee retention. Um, all the evidence that's out there suggests that female-run, female-owned businesses think about employees differently. Um, and I'm changing up the question just a little bit from what I, I asked you when we talked about this. Why do you think that is? Like, what's different? What's different? Or what's different to you when you look at other people in the industry who maybe have a different model about thinking about why you hire people or how you hold on to people or what a team is or why it matters. What Tanya said is the details kind of comes naturally to um, feminine style leadership. Uh, and I think it's empathy. It's what Julie said, it's empathy. Um, I think uh, a lot of females have a little bit more empathetic style of leadership. Uh, and I think when you're hiring people, when you're creating teams, empathy is probably the top skill, soft skill that um, is gonna help you be success, truly. Um, but it's those details too, when it comes to, um, you know, sending a thank you card or <laughs> send many of those, right? Yeah. I'll jump on this one. Um, the reason I think that is, is because women are the only ones who can be pregnant and have a baby and have a nursing infant. And that creates, and then also feel the, I'm very driven and goal oriented. And to think that I might lose an opportunity because I'm gonna have a baby is very like makes my skin boil. Mm -hmm. Like that is, you know, so instead of me being frustrated about it, it changed my goal. So I was gonna be successful in spite of and then create a system to help other women in practice be successful too. So um, so I think it's you know, the generational years and years of, of me seeing in the chiropractic profession, women in business who were chiropractors, as soon as they would start to have a family, they would no longer practice. They would become stay at home moms. And so I put off having a family, I think for that reason, because I was so career driven for many, many years. In fact, I thought at one point that I was never going to get married and never had kids because I didn't have an example in my life where I could see another chiropractor doing it because all my mentors were males and they had never had a nine month big belly adjusting a patient. They just have, it's, you know, they can't do that. <laughs> so that's our superpower. Um, and I think, I think that that drives a whole different element of feeling like you, you know, you had to take a step back and couldn't pursue that passion and further your career because you had to do this it feels slightly less than. So um, we want to create an environment where you can do both and you can push your career pedal and you can push your family pedal and do it at the same time successfully. Um, and one of the things that, you know, you talk about customer feedback that I asked you about like, why me up right. here? And one of the things was, you know, we see, we see you bringing your kid to work. Like I brought my baby to work. I adjusted up to, to labor and delivery. And then we encourage our employees to be able to bring their children to work up, you know, to eight or nine months until they get um, really opinionated. But that critical time <laughs> of the kids, infant, okay. yeah, <laughs> the critical time of infancy, like we, um, I, man I mandate loosely, I mandate um, three months of maternity leave. I think that is super critical. And you know, so many women in chiropractic and in so many other industries, they're like, oh, I got to get back to work mm -hmm. after three or four weeks. I mean, this is, I think, very detrimental to the health and wellness of our, of our, of the United States. It's not like this in other countries. Mm -hmm. So, right. um, so that's, you know, 
long of a short. I guess. And, and before we we go to other folks, I just I want to remind you of a comment that you made to me, which I thought was really insightful. Is that you you talked about in the hiring process saying to employees, if you're not comfortable holding a baby, yeah. then this or is changing not a diaper, right, or changing a diaper, this is not the right place for you, right? So it, it was this whole idea of sort of creating culture. that culture all the way through, right? Everybody's got to be on board if that's going to be successful. Yeah. I thought that was and, really interesting. And patients and customers love it. Mm -hmm. And it's inspiring when you can see, you know, a women-owned business and multiple female doctors and their kids are in and it's like this, um, like almost like a poetic chaos and it's working smoothly. Um, and people are just like, wow, it, it can be done, you know? Right. And so I would love to see this in more industries and, and more workspaces. And I think, you know, you guys have the capacity to make this difference, right? Andy, Julie? Anything you to add? Well, I don't have anything else to uh, I think just investing in your teams um, is important. Taking the extra time to um, continue education um, or um, just you know, bringing an outside perspective maybe to give them a voice. Um, and then, you know, obviously all of you, the bottom line, you know, pay is important. Right. Um, and so um, we have set up like a specific pay and performance plan that's um, quarterly given out. And so staff know that they can, you know, they're continuing to meet goals if they can reach those. And, um, you know, having, it still has to bottom line, line item, you know, but it has to balance on the sheet, but at the same time, um, investing a little bit more than um, you might get at a traditional request store, um, hopefully helps keep that on the line. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to see if we have a little bit of time to uh, see if the audience has any questions. So we talked about the worst piece of advice. I now would like you to give advice. If you were to give one piece of advice to someone who wants to start something new, what would it be? One of you is going to get to say, just do it. And then the other four are going to have to tell something. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> make it easy work. Um, yeah, take it. I mean, of course, take action, do it. Um, but no, truly, you all, like Rache said, you you all have the ability to make a difference. And when you start a business or own a business or become an entrepreneur within a company, you can make these changes that you want to see. So all of this crap that you got, you know, that we're complaining about up here as women that we are trying to change, you know, microscopically within our businesses, you all will take that next step, hopefully, um, and be a voice for your own company, whether again, you're, you're an entrepreneur starting a company or, or, or going into a company. So, you know, whatever, you, starting a business is funny because it's like you start your own little ecosystem, right? Like you start your dream world. And you're going to make all these rules and everybody else has to follow those rules. You're like, they're not rules. It's a vision. You know, it's fun. It's dreamy. Right. And so if you're starting a business, make sure that it's a world you want to be in and make sure that you're not just um, doing what you've always seen. Right. Be creative, be innovative and make those changes that you want to see, because being a business leader truly is that you're a leader in your community, you're a leader in your society, and you should be making those changes and making a difference. And so truly, whatever you choose to do after you graduate, just make sure it's something that's that's changing the world in some way, shape, or form, because um, those ideas that you have, they don't serve anybody by staying inside of you. They serve no one, especially yourself. So those ideas that you wanna get out into the world, be brave enough to share those because you will impact even if it's just one person, you'll make a change. I'd say build a good team around yourself. Um, and so if you're starting a business, that might be getting a life, you know, getting some coaching advice or um, accounting advice or whatever. Or um, if you're building a team together, finding someone that has strengths that complement yours, knowing your own strengths and, you know, the things that you maybe need help with. Um, and so building that good team. And then in that, people will come and go, especially if you're the founder.
founder of the business. Um, <laughs> but um, being okay with that and knowing, you know, your next team is going to be your best. Yeah, I'm going to say believe yourself. Um, don't listen to what anyone tell you it's not going to work. Uh, every person know their ability. Um, if you do believe in yourself, just do it, you know, it's worth it. Um, I would say have a cheerleader. Look for mm -hmm. a cheerleader rating plan that you can talk to. You can bounce off the ideas, good, bad, who's always rooting for you. Because not every day sunshine rainbow. Mm -hmm. For sure. I'm going to say find your niche. Find the one thing that you're the very, very best at and become the best at that. And so you're never going to stop learning. You're going to go to lengths to find every piece of information so that when somebody comes to you for whatever that is that you chose, that's your passion and your fuel, you literally are the best. And you know that you are going to give them, you know in your heart of hearts that you're going to give them the best quality product. You're going to give them the best quality service. I'm going to ask if uh, anybody in the audience has a question. We've got a minute or two before we wrap things up. Anybody? Uh, how did you find your coaching? Like your lifestyle and business coach, was it someone you met networking or was it just someone online that you met in? Or... So when I was an associate, he was actually, he was a chiro chiropractor, but he was kind of phasing out. He was on to a new business venture. So he was only in the practice for one day. So he actually hired a coach <laughs> to coach us, even though that's why I went to work for him. And so he could coach me. So that that was kind of my first introductory and it was, um, he, yeah, he was intense. And then when I became a clinic director, I joined a BNI group. Mm -hmm. So business networking international is all across. And again, that's an ego thing. A lot of people are like, Oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm too good for that. But I did everything. I wasn't too good for cleaning the toilets. So, um, so I met, um, action coach, business coach for coaching or business coach, not just for sports basically coaching not just for sports and they do business coaching. And because we were in the same BNI group, I took the leap. I'm still coaching with him to this day because he now coaches my team. So it's, um, then I had, um, after it's like, it's evolutionarily, right? Like you, you create these connections in your community and meaningful relationships and you just, you're like, Oh, what do you do? Like I just did, I just got asked to be on a podcast of somebody who's, I had no idea of what she did, but I knew she was kind of like a life coach. Um, and she, I learned after being on the podcast, I was like, oh, that's, you know, that was a great conversation. I wonder what like actual coaching she does. And it's all about neurological systems of the brain and how to kind of rewire and find your strengths. And, and so I booked a coaching call with her, like an introductory coaching call. So um, because that sounds like something I would really love. And I think it would take me to the next level. Um, my life, my life coach right now is called work hard, play hard. And he was also a chiropractor and I met him through my first mentor. Um, and he now lives in Italy and has a completely different lifestyle. And, and I thought you're traveling all over. Like we went to Greece with him. We went to Lake Como. Um, we traveled all through, uh, COVID, which I would have never traveled in COVID if it wasn't for him. So like finding your biggest cheerleader, those were the people that I sought out. Anybody else have any comments on finding mentors or coaching? Okay. Other question? Who else do you want? Um, this isn't for anybody can answer this question, but all of you touched on your stories of why you're in Spokane, but what specifically about Spokane has allowed your businesses to flourish and do as well as they've done? Great question. It's a really good question. Um, for me, it was just uh, pantry field hyper local. It was really easy initially. Um, you know, my vision was to source locally as much as possible, and so making it really easy um, uh, to to source. You know, up at Green Bluff, I remember like one of my last trips up to Green Bluff Farms. If you ever been to Green Bluff Farms? Like, I'd pick up like a hundred pounds of. Um, uh, squash, I think it was some, like piling in the back of my car. It's like early on pantry fuel, early on days, but uh, you know, made it really easy to source locally. And um, 
uh, a community in the community in Spokane is pretty tight knit. Um, as you'll notice, I mean Gonzaga is really tight knit. Uh, but you get outside in the Spokane and you start learning. Oh, you know her. Who knows her? Who knows him? You know, and you're connected in some way, shape, or form, and that really helps the businesses here in Spokane flourish through word of mouth. Um, so word of mouth marketing in Spokane is really, really strong. Um, and that was beneficial to my business. I think we've had the benefit of, um, you know, it's just a, it's a running town in the sense of Don Cardon's, you know, Bloomsday, how many years? I think we're almost to 50, but uh, so, you know, we have that heritage that uh, was a great thing to become a part of. Um, and then the Centennial Trail is such a gift that we have. Um, we're just fully out and active. So two things about specific, specifically about Spokane, we have a gigantic healthcare system. So if you look at downtown, it's full of hospitals. We have three schools. We have schools of medicine. I mean, we have tons of medical facilities. So that created a very specific gap because I definitely didn't graduate as an MD. Um, so it was the alternative healthcare that I think also people who are healthy and running and looking for healthy meals, um, they want to be healthy and more and more um, without the use of drugs and surgery. So there's, I think in general, even outside of Spokane in general, there's a really big gap and opportunity in, in chiropractic. Um, but then as far as my specific technique, I specialize in the head and the neck, it's called upper cervical. There's only three upper cervical docs in Spokane and all three of them, when I moved here, had been in practice, white, male, uh, oh, been in practice for over 30 years. So I'm, you know, very different than that. <laughs> Any other thoughts on this? I mean, my only other thought was because Spokane is so small and so tight knit, is that integrity means mm -hmm. so much more here in town. Mm -hmm. So, a little bit different take. But yeah. Well, I'm going to call it here because I want to make sure that we have some time for you to meet our panelists. So, um, I just like to thank all of you for being here and sharing your insights with us. Thank you very much for for giving us the time. Thank you.